Our final two speakers will focus on efforts to address environmental health through housing initiatives at the community and neighborhood level. We will first hear from Valerie Stewart, Director of Healthy Communities at the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation. She will be sharing the Foundation's commitment to advancing community health through collaborative partnerships. She is joined by Josie Williams, Executive Director for the Greensboro Housing Coalition, a leading housing nonprofit in North Carolina. Josie will be speaking about their ongoing efforts, working directly with the community to address environmental factors and improve health outcomes. We are so pleased you're both with us today. Valerie, I'll start by turning it over to you. Wonderful, thank you. And here at the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation, our mission is to improve the health and well-being of everyone living in North Carolina. One approach we've taken with that is community-centered health, which is our long-term multi-dimensional approach to increasing the capacity of North Carolina's communities to act on the root causes of health inequities through partnerships, policy, and systems change. And while this investment began five years ago, it's still very much alive today and has been a significant milestone and shift for us toward prioritizing social determinants of health and increasing our focus on advancing health equity. So a few key components of the approach that I'll just highlight are multi-sector collaborations, so it's clinical, public, private, government, all working together to identify the root causes of those inequities, to name those and get explicit about uh, how communities can create change through policy systems and environmental shifts. And these are community-driven, community-designed uh, solutions that really center the voices and lived experiences of those most proximate to the problems. These shifts all allow for community mobilization, whether it's environmental health or in addressing other systemic and structural inequities. We've been partnering with and learning from Josie Williams, along with Collaborative Cottage Grove, the residents and the leaders there in Greensboro, and really can look no further than to their collaboration, which serves as a clear example of the transformation that is possible when communities build power and pave the way for lasting community change. So, Josie, we're grateful to you for your tireless efforts and advocacy to shift that power and the systems for the health of your community. It's so telling that you believe that we fight not just for community, but with community. So, Josie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Valerie, and um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. I want to... Um, hopefully not take up too much time. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, I wanted to share with you guys today uh, maybe some under to give you some understanding of the reality of what happens in these communities um, when they are disproportionately impacted by uh, many of the um, factors that you've heard of in the previous slide. Uh, but first I want to give you some context of our partnership that Valerie mentioned. Um, we lead the, or one of the leaders in the Collaborative Cottage Grove. Um, it is a multi-sector partnership that includes um, our health system, Cone Health, our Department of Health, Gilbert Kelly Department of Health, a host of neighborhood organizations and neighborhood associations, um, our North Carolina Legal Aid universities, um, and we are a multi-sector partnership that also includes our city officials from the uh, Greensboro um, City of Greensboro along with uh, Parks and Rec. Um, this was very strategic in understanding because we knew that if we were trying to address many of the factors that you guys just heard about in this presentation, you need a true collaborative multi-sector approach. Um, but the uh, underlining, I guess you can say, success of the partnership is the fact that we are uh, resident-led and our strategies are developed by and with the residents leading um, at the front end. And I say that um, to say oftentimes we involve residents on the tail end of a, a so-called community change without asking them uh, what they want to see happen differently in their community. So our approach is founded on not just having a seat at the table, but they actually set the table. And so um, what we um, just, as far as the background, just a little bit about the community. Um, 
I think from the information that you've heard, uh, we can all glean from that a lot of uh, the disproportional impact of the factors that you've heard happens in low-income communities that happen in predominantly African-American communities, um, communities of color. Um, so I don't want to dwell on that. Um, I think that's a given, but I do want to give some context regarding um, Cottage Grove in particular. There are other examples that I can give, but I want to focus this presentation on the Cottage Grove community. And so um, this picture that you have up here in front of you is a snapshot overview of the community. Um, what I want to briefly highlight on is the fact that this community um, has some environmental issues um, related to substandard housing, related to poverty, um, related to high incidences of asthma complications due to the conditions that, our, that the community members um, are impacted by. And so these maps here illustrate respiratory-related hospital admissions by patients diagnosed with asthma. What I want to briefly point out is when you look at these maps, you can see a theme or you can see a commonality. Um, one of these is the top map. The top map on the left is an actual red line map of Greensboro. And when you look at the red and yellow, those hot spots there, that coincides with the same map on the far right, that respiratory-related as hospital asthma. When you look at the bottom two maps, that percent of population living below poverty and the life expectancy, the, the hot spots, the darker colors, they coincide across each map. So when we look at the intersectionality between poverty, environmental conditions, and, that as, and those asthma hotspots, they all coincide within a particular area, and that happens to be Cottage Grove. And we see this across different communities and across the country. Um, the other thing regarding the environmental condition of this uh, um, community, it's well known um, that um, oftentimes uh, African community, community, communities, low-income communities, um, we have seen where these communities have been the subject of environmental injustice. Um, this particular community has a park um, named Bingham Park. That park sits on top of an old landfill. The two pictures, the first two pictures in this slide, um, the first one is a, ma a map that was uh, illustrated pro roughly two, three years ago. Um, that is actually where the incinerator, those red circles, the incinerator of that landfill was sitting in that uh, park or on that piece of land. The map in the middle is a historical map. That is the same map, just a different time. But the reason I'm pointing that out is because right there in the middle, Maple Cemetery, I don't know if you, how well you can see this, but there's a cemetery right there in the middle. This landfill encompassed that whole piece of land. Um, the streets and things that you see, now some of the street names are different now, but all of that still exists today. The map, on, the picture on the far right, that is Apache Street Park. That park sits behind um, one of the apartment complexes that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. I'm pointing this out because all of this happens is intersecting right in Cottage Grove, so I'm gonna jump around a, a little bit. When we look at this particular slide, the intersectionality between asthma incidences, uh, vacancy, substandard housing and poverty intersect in those same locations on these maps. All I did was shrunk it down a little bit and highlighted the area. So in this all, uh, intersects within this Cottage Grove community. So you can imagine the impact of having a landfill sitting under a park. There's a stream that runs behind that park and runs through the whole entire neighborhood behind the Apache Street Park that you see on this slide. Um, also within this neighborhood, we have conditions uh, where we have a lot of substandard housing. That is being improved now, and so I, again, I'll try not to dwell on it, but I have to give you the context so you can understand the reality of the conditions that people are living in. So this is formerly, now this is called Cottage Gardens, but this is what Avalon Trace, what this apartment complex used to be called, used to look like. 177 unit of substandard housing complex 
with a high incident of asthma conditions. So what you see in these pictures, people were actually living next door to these units. So you can imagine if you're living next door to this type of property, you can imagine what your unit condition is, is how that's being impacted by what's next door. You would think that that's an abandoned building. That's not an abandoned building. I'm just highlighting the condition, and, and just so you understand, there are people living next door. Now, particularly the picture that the window looks boarded up, so to speak. Um, that's what the residents were using to close the window. That, is, that was actually a family of four living in that with two small kids. So now that you have some context to understand what people were actually experiencing, um, the beauty about what I wanted to point out is this community is so resilient, so tenacious, and they started working with the multi-sector partnership to create the vision of what they wanted to see for change. And that included a reduction in doctor and ER visits related to those environmental conditions that re also related to the remediation of substandard housing that exasperated asthma, an increase in clinical community partnerships, and um, uh, being able to address the root causes um, through policy system and environmental change because we are aware from what you just heard and from what I'm describing, to make those changes, this is a red line community. This is a community that lacked um, investment into, um, that lacked investment to the point that it created the conditions that I'm describing. So when we're looking to address that, we have to look at policy and system. We have to look at um, environmental conditions because these are the things that perpetuate that type of environment. And we won't be able to create those changes unless we address those systematic structures. Um, the, the community also wanted to have a walkable community. This is a historical red line community without the investment. So sidewalks were non-existent. Um, and so the methods and strategies that we use, Valerie described to you about this community-centered approach. Um, again, that multi-sector partnership coming together to address those factors. We began also um, and actually founded on, uh, as I mentioned, resident voice and community engagement and building capacity. That is prioritized. We don't make decisions regarding those changes unless the residents say that this is what they want to do. Because if you can get the residents to buy in and they have ownership within their community, then you can get a lot more done. And then also, if they are in alignment with your agendas or the organization agenda, um, then it's easy to come together on a common vision to create the changes and then you get buy-in across those different sectors. And more importantly, you have the buy-in of the community. Um, not that that's easy because there, that means there has to be a cultural shift. This is a very grassroots, ground-up approach versus we know that our organizations are used to working from the top down. Um, that does not work <laughs> over time um, because I've found out in my experience you can try that, but you will come back to the drawing board. And residents have the power as they begin to speak up and they feel more um, empowered and they've built more capacity. They can create the changes. We can see that now what's going on in, our, in, our, in the climate that we're working on in, in, this, in, in this world today. So we had a clinical shift. We wanted to collaborate directly with our community partners and our clinical partners. We wanted to have a multi-sector collaboration. We wanted to leverage the resources across those organizations and the assets in the community. We wanted to increase the capacity on the individual level, and that leads to increasing a community capacity overall. And we were doing that by creating sustainable strategies for sustainable solutions. Because at the end of the day, if the residents are helping you create those strategies, that's what would make it more sustainable. And that's why Cottage Collaborative Cottage Grove has been together with those partners and they keep strengthening, we keep expanding. Um, and I've been doing this work with them since 2016. Um, and that led to a lot of advocacy for policy system and environmental changes. The reason I put this picture up, this is an actual flyer that when we started working in the partnership, the first thing we wanted to do was invite everyone in the community to come out and meet with us. Our partner meetings are usually um, when we, prior to COVID, we would have 30, 40 residents every single month come out. Now we do that online. That's been a challenge due to COVID-19 and the technology divide. COVID-19 is exasperating these factors. All these things that you just heard in these previous um, presentations and the things that I'm describing now, these things already existed. We were already in a housing pandemic before COVID-19. So when you take those factors and you layer COVID-19 on top of it, 
it's no wonder that a community like Cottage Grove and others that we see across the country are being impacted disproportionately. And so in order for us to continue that founding, uh, that grounded in resident voice and community leadership, we didn't back off our partner meetings. We actually ramped it up. So we start meeting every two weeks versus once a month, and we continue to do that. The outcome now and the outcome then is we still get that community voice at the table, and we still are able to integrate effective clinical services and advocacy for policy systems. That led to the remediation of Apache Street Park, which you can see the pictures on the left, that led to an increased engagement, even though we're trying to do that online. We're just being more, a little bit more creative about it. That led to um, getting an apartment um, complex rehab, um, and we did that uh, through public-private partnerships and um, uh, some other forces through the City of Greensboro funds that they were um, able to put forth toward this rehab as well. The picture I'm highlighting up in that top left corner of this illustrates the type of meetings we have. That picture is an illustration of all these organizations coming together with the residents at the table. And the residents actually helped plan that meeting. Um, and I, I know that was quick because we're running out of time, but I do want to also point out this approach has positive and measurable outcomes. So that led to a deeper partnership within our cone health system. So we are able to share and implement upstream strategies. We are able to partner with our Department of Health in a more um, deeper way that our community ties are strengthening. We've been able to implement a uh, pediatric residency program where I know they have engagement opportunities, but they actually engage with us directly with us and work in the community with us when that program exists. Um, and then here's some other things that just to highlight on that program, the things that have um, transpired because of that. We've seen an A1C drop in over 20% of participants and a BMI decrease. We've had sidewall implementations. Uh, the Bingham Park with the landfill that I mentioned about, um, that is under remediation. Um, those 177 units have been rehabbed, and we have increased neighborhood access to healthy food and vegetables. Even now, there's a food distribution uh, site that has now grown to the point from one site to five, and now we're advanced and into Guilford, uh, Alamance County, and we're in Guilford County in North Carolina. Um, and that is not an institution thing. That is all led by community members that is led by faith-based organizations, and that is led by um, the residents in the community pushing their voice to say, we are lacking food access in the food desert in the midst of COVID-19 and no one's helping us. And so they started coming together and that ended up having a food distribution project that's still active right now and it's, and it's expanding. So we continue to grow. And I just wanna say, close with this. Um, again, the strategies that we implement, um, more importantly, have to do with the residents' voice guiding from the beginning. Um, and the traditional norm of doing uh, like we've normally done in times past, bringing someone on the, on the tail end, doesn't necessarily work if we're looking at sustainable solutions over time. So I'm sorry that was really fast because I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to turn that back over to our hosts um, and, and let them close out or do Q&A or however you guys want to do that. 